Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing very well. So today's video is a little bit different. This is a follow-up to a video that I did a few months ago where I compared the 1940 version of Rebecca to the 2020 version that came out on Netflix last year. Now in that video, I did say that I intended to make this a kind of reoccurring series on my channel. I wasn't quite sure what I would be naming this series, but essentially what I'll be doing is kind of picking films that have similar themes or perhaps they're an adaptation of the same story and I'm going to be pitting them against each other <laughs> just kind of letting them battle it out and then ultimately I will decide which film wins in these videos so that's what we're going to be doing today and as you can see from the title the two films that we're going to be talking about in this video are I Feel Pretty and Isn't It Romantic now these would have been the perfect films to explore on Valentine's Day okay and that was initially my intention to do so but then I ended up feeling quite unwell <laughs> quite unwell on Valentine's Day so you're getting it a few days late unfortunately but still I guess you know love is always in the air so maybe we can apply this to any day especially since it's less than a week after Valentine's Day okay maybe this is a late Valentine's Day present listen <laughs> but ultimately I do know that this video is quite random and it probably won't do as well as a searchable video so if you could go ahead and give this video a like if you do enjoy it and please be sure to comment down below and let me know what your thoughts are on these two films or if you have any suggestions for the films that I could pit against each other next in this series. And as per usual, please be sure to subscribe to my channel and make sure you turn on your notifications so that you can be told when I upload next. So without further ado, let the battle commence. Today we're going to be putting I Feel Pretty up against Isn't It Romantic? Let's do this. If you're familiar with both of these films, then you'll have an inkling for as to why I decided to pit these two against each other in today's video because they do cover very similar themes. <laughs> and I I remember thinking when both of these came out at the time that they came out that if only I had a YouTube channel <laughs> where I could talk about the similarities and differences that these films have I would really get down to the nitty-gritty and that's exactly what we're going to be doing today you're just humoring me <laughs> well, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the plots of these films first of all we have I Feel Pretty which came out in 2018 and was directed by Abby Kahn and Mark Silverstein now here we have the character of Renee Bennett who's portrayed by Emmy Shuma, we'll talk about her in a second, but she struggles with low self-esteem and manages the website for a cosmetics firm called Lily Leclerc. She decides not to apply for a receptionist position at the corporate headquarters, which would be her dream job, after reading the job's description's emphasis on being beautiful. She wishes Adolf found him to be beautiful and the next day she falls, hitting her head. Waking up with the belief that her appearance has magically changed, Renee approaches the world with newfound confidence. So that is the setup of this film, the premise that it works off of. And this is, of course, playing on some tropes that we've seen time and time again in the rom-com genre. And we'll be discussing this at length throughout this video because both of these films do so. And speaking of both of the films, let's talk about our second contender here where we have Isn't It Romantic, which was directed by Todd strauss Schulson. So here we have an architect named Natalie who is portrayed by Rebel Wilson and she develops a strong hatred for romantic comedies at an early age which is exacerbated by her low self-esteem and difficulty in finding love. Her assistant Whitney is a huge fan of romantic comedies and believes their co-worker Josh is in love with Natalie but Natalie dismisses the notion because Josh appears to spend all of his time staring at a billboard across the street. One day Natalie is knocked unconscious during an attempted mugging and finds herself trapped in the stereotypical romantic comedy that she despises. So now that I've broken down the overall story of each of these films you can kind of already see the similarities in the themes that are explored here but first up the first category that we're going to be judging these films by are the main leads and their performances because I think this is fascinating <laughs> okay but before we even dive into this I just need to preface this little section by saying we are not going to be discussing the actresses themselves okay this is a video about the films <laughs> the films on screen it is not about the actresses and what they got up to off screen. I know that during the time especially that I Feel Pretty came out, Amy Schumer was a hot topic. People were ready to jump on the Amy Schumer hate train like nothing else, okay? And I completely understand that there are reasons behind it, you know, aside from just misogyny, there were reasons behind the Amy Schumer hatred, but I'm not going to be entertaining that in this video today. It has absolutely nothing to do with what we're going to be discussing. And in the case of Rebel Wilson, there was a little bit of controversy surrounding her comments during the time where she was promoting this film, actually 
where she said that this was a revolutionary film in the sense that it had a plus size female lead in the way that we had never seen before in a romantic comedy but this is of course untrue because as many people pointed out Queen Latifah had already paved the way <laughs> in this very same genre even so unfortunately it came across as Rebel Wilson trying to erase Queen Latifah's progress so that was a <laughs> bad move on her part but we're not going to be discussing any of that right now we're just going to be focusing on these characters and the way that these actresses portrayed them. Whilst it may not have been entirely revolutionary that Rebel Wilson was a plus size lead in a romantic comedy it is a big deal <laughs> like it is still a big deal because it is scarcely seen like truly like where <laughs> where we have a handful of examples here and two of these examples are being explored in this video so to be fair to Rebel Wilson perhaps she wasn't the first but she sure is in a very small group in a very small category of female leads especially for romantic comedies so we have to give props to her and to Amy Schumer for portraying these plus size characters because it is very scarcely seen in this genre and indeed in Hollywood overall listen we're not going to be talking about fat phobia today but it's noted okay it's seen and it's noted and this is particularly important when it comes to comparing both of these films because they both explore the topic of these women being plus size women it's not something that's just ignored it is very much a part of their personalities as you've probably heard from earlier they both suffer from self-esteem issues and some of that is rooted in the fat phobia that is experienced in society and how that's kind of been internalized and led to a lot of insecurities within themselves and the feeling that they don't feel worthy of being loved and adored the way that some other women do um, in society if they're conventionally beautiful. These themes are explored in both films but to different effect. I personally think Amy Schumer's portrayal of Renee was so deeply relatable and real. As someone who can relate to her struggles with insecurities and low self-esteem in herself and her plus size body, I think Amy portrayed these feelings in a very real, un-Hollywoodized way. She wasn't overly melodramatic and sure she did have humorous moments here and there because it is after all a rom-com but it just felt like real life struggles that she faced on a daily basis and you could see the, the insecurities that were eating away at her. To me it just felt so relatable, it also just felt so genuinely sad. I completely related to the scenes where for example she's putting on this shapewear and tugging it over her body and hopelessly following YouTube tutorials as she gets ready for a night out with her friends. I think Amy Schumer carried out those scenes so so well. Again it played to the comedic aspect but it also was very much rooted in reality and a lot of pathos actually and you could feel the insecurities that were bubbling up inside of this character and it's so important that we got that because at the beginning it kind of sets up the headspace that this character is at and it acts as a great contrast to how she acts throughout the majority of the film after she's knocked in the head. <laughs> but on the flip side of this I would say that I wasn't the biggest fan of Rebel Wilson's portrayal of Natalie because instead of advancing the conversation surrounding weight and the struggles of dating as a plus size woman the way that I feel pretty does you just get more fat jokes. <laughs> you get a ton of fat jokes. I uh Rebel Wilson's shtick okay was getting old by this time. I'd sat through some of the Pitch Perfect films and like they're fine but at this point her fat shtick, her fat jokes were getting quite old for me personally. I always cringed at them. I was tired of plus size people or fat people being the brunt of every single joke. Like I, I'd had enough at that point. And so to see some of that sprinkle throughout her performance in this film, although to a lesser extent to be fair, I was kind of put off by it. <laughs> I was kind of off by it I was like oh please no please don't tell me I have to sit through this again oh <laughs> I'm tired no no more let's abolish this now let's abolish fat jokes forever please and the main issue for me when it comes to her blumbering fat person routine is that it sometimes lacks dignity and it is so played out and it also makes the character feel more like a caricature as opposed to a three-dimensional character in the way that I believe Renee was able to come across in I feel pretty however like I said it was a relative restrained comedic performance by Rebel Wilson so it didn't quite fall into the same stereotypes as the scenes that we've seen in like I said films like uh, Pitch Perfect and even Bridesmaids so thankfully it wasn't quite as bad and this is also quite important because here she's playing a lead and not just a, a wacky sidekick character so if she had kept that up for like the majority of the film it would have been far more grating than when we get her in smaller doses in other films when she's a side character so overall when it comes to the portrayal 
styles of the lead characters I feel pretty wins hands down I liked the character of Renee a lot I like the transformation that she goes through mentally and the way that it affects her and her physical presence when she moves around the world but I also liked seeing the before I think it was so relatable seeing the struggle that Renee went through with her insecurities a lot of them stemming from the way that she perceives herself physically but also mentally and emotionally which we'll talk about later on but I just think Amy Schumer just did so, such a good job honestly such a good job as this character and they often say that when it comes to comedians they toe the line between drama and comedy very very well and I think Amy Schumer's performance in the first half of this film specifically was a perfect example of that so the next category we're going to be going through are the character arcs of these respective leads in the films and I can already say that I feel pretty wins <laughs> I feel pretty wins hands down however I am going to explain to you why because I have a, a good reason a very very good reason several in fact so first of all the struggles that Renee faces at the beginning are very relatable as I already said and they also feel very realistic they're not just about being superficially attractive and it's about this deep sense of insecurity in oneself that affects everything from dating life to even career aspirations which is excellently exemplified here this shows that it's not just about the superficiality of how someone looks it's about the energy it's about the attention and the about the encouragement that people receive when they look a certain way and how that affects the way that you move through your life and we can see that through the character of Renee perfectly because she's gotten a certain amount of energy a certain amount of doubt when people are dealing with her she has internalized a lot of that and feels less than when it comes to you know trying to aspire towards her goals of being this receptionist at this cosmetics company's headquarters she feels like she's not good enough for that job even though she's more than qualified she has the talent for it but because of the energy that she's been receiving by others she's internalized that negativity and it's done such a number on her self-esteem that she just feels so unworthy and another key point to notice here when it comes to Renee's character arc in I Feel Pretty is that it is completely separate from her love life from any other character in the story it is just about her she learns to appreciate her friends more while also finding love in her relationship with Ethan but even stripping all of that away she ends up being a more fulfilled woman because she sees her beauty again and it's not just a superficial beauty but the value in her unique perspective and skills that she has to offer to her career so even aside from her relationships with her friends or even with Ethan she's able to come out of this story as a better person because she's more secure in herself and her talents and what she has to offer to the world it's that level of confidence that projects her forward it's not the relationships that she has with other people we'll talk about that in a second when we're comparing it to isn't it romantic but we'll get to that in a second the final reason why I think that Renee's character arc is superior to that of Natalie's from isn't it romantic is because the plot device of her bumping her head and getting her brain rewired is used to an even funnier extent because she thinks that that she is more beautiful even though there are no actual physical changes that have occurred the plot device isn't real there is no actual magic it's all in the power of her mindset this means that her character arc is actually entirely in her hands rather than in the hands of an all-powerful plot device and i think this is such a powerful message to send to have this plot device that we often see within this genre specifically except this time it's been reversed almost where it's not actually effective and renee just believes that there have been physical changes to her body to make her infinitely more attractive to the rest of the world but really nothing has changed <laughs> i think it's funnier first of all like i said especially when you see the reactions of her friends and they're like you <laughs> you look the <laughs> you look exactly the same but she's convinced like she's convinced oh my god look at me like i'm completely different i can barely recognize myself and everyone else is just side-eyeing her like okay <laughs> clearly my girl needs a nap like clearly she needs to rest her head she bumped it really really hard she doesn't know what she's talking about i think that's so much funnier than there having actually been a change in her physicality but also like i said it means that 
every single change that she goes through the arc that she goes through in this film is down to her because there was no magical intervention okay so now let's contrast this against natalie's character arc and isn't it romantic so here natalie's character arc is wholly reliant on the plot device that her world has actually transformed into a rom-com paradise and it takes her having to live in a reality of rom-coms which life has forced her to resent to realize that love is right in front of her that the love of her life is right in front of her in josh now both of these films have an element of the women realizing that they have so much value to offer beyond just the romantic interests that come into their lives throughout the film for example in the case of natalie with her you know architectural pitch where she has that great idea that liam hensworth's character almost stole from her and she's able to deliver on that and they're able to see her as a leader for the first time in the company which is a great story for her but i do think still that in i feel pretty there is much more emphasis overall on renee's professional skills she has this huge launch event where she can share that profound message at this huge crowd that are emotionally touched by her words with natalie her accomplishments go noticed in the meeting but the real goal is for her to realize that her friend josh was in love with her the whole time so really when it comes to isn't it romantic the emphasis is placed on her relationship with josh and the fact that all this time when she believed josh to be drooling <laughs> over this picture of Priyanka Chopra Jonas <laughs> really he was just staring at her in awe because he was in love with her that's kind of the defining moment the kind of big moment that this film emphasizes at the end whereas when it comes to I feel pretty Renee's big moment is where she does that pitch where she talks about you know being beautiful inside and out and having something to offer and feeling that sense of confidence even though nothing really changed about her where she has that moment of realization on stage where <laughs> the whole crowd is looking at her like is this girl crazy like she always looked the same it all comes together and it really seems to touch and affect the people in the crowd and i feel like that was just such a bigger moment for the character it really made that story arc come to fruition in a way that you know isn't it romantic didn't really fully commit to because it was more of a b storyline in the case of natalie whereas the a storyline in that film was very much her getting together with josh and also another problem that isn't it romantic suffers from at least in my opinion is the fact that the plot device doesn't doesn't necessarily correlate with Natalie's story arc it doesn't really have anything to do with the lesson that she's supposed to be learning at least how I perceived the lesson she's supposed to be learning to be because why did she need to enter this alternate reality satirizing rom-coms to speak up and stand up for herself at work or to realize that Josh was the one for her I don't feel like that was a necessary twist <laughs> a necessary plot device for her to have in order to realize these things in order to come to these conclusions it seemed to me that the plot device overall was just a fun little gag to have but in reality the character doesn't really have anything to do with that because the lesson that she's supposed to learn isn't that rom-coms are great and they're not as bad as she thought that they were or at least as bad as she was taught to believe them to be the lesson here is that she has people who love her and who appreciate her around her and she has a lot to offer when it comes to her relationships whether they be friendships or a romantic relationship and also to her career like that's the lesson overall I don't understand where rom-com tropes come into it it's not like she was in love with Liam Hemsworth's character at the beginning to begin with so it's not as if she needed to learn that lesson about appreciating Josh and not Blake like that's not it had nothing to do with anything <laughs> she already thought that he was out of her league and then in the end he was out of her league I don't understand <laughs> why we had to go through all of that other than the fact that it was fun and cute which again we'll discuss later on so next up we have the love interest the love interest is such an important part part of a rom-com i had to put it here as a category to to contend these films against so first up we have josh who's the love interest in isn't it romantic and i would say that adam divine is really likable and charismatic as josh there are times when you can see some strain in him trying to really lay on thick as the love interest but that's if you look at it with an overly critical eye like i did <laughs> for this video <laughs> but overall i just think he's such a lovely character the way that he treats natalie in this film as a genuine friend but also someone that he respects wholeheartedly I think was really really lovely to see and actually in a small plot twist within this video I did actually prefer Josh from Isn't It Romantic to Rory Scovel's Ethan in I Feel Pretty as a love interest. Now Ethan had some interesting character traits he also goes on a small character journey of his own being someone who suffers from a lot of insecurities that mirror um, that of Amy Schumer's character Renee and I did think it was interesting to see the parallels in those characters when they're together the fact that Renee 
day has kind of been ridded of all those um insecurities that she had because of this you know magical spell that doesn't actually exist but Ethan is kind of looking at her with a lot of admiration and awe for the confidence <laughs> that she exudes from her um, and I think it was interesting to see a male character in a rom-com have these insecurities I think it was very refreshing in that way but I didn't buy them as much as a couple unfortunately I don't think they had that same chemistry together it felt like they were very good friends <laughs> it felt like they were very good friends and he respected her a lot as a friend but to me it wasn't spicy enough honestly neither of these couples are spicy enough we'll talk about that in a second but if I had to choose which I do for this video I would put Josh and Natalie over um Ethan and Renee just because uh, the chemistry between them is just so much more interesting even though Josh himself lacks any character arc any significant character arc in his film i would say when it comes to you know the journey that that character goes through i would put ethan over him but overall he's just a much more likable character to be frank but still <laughs> but still like i said i'm largely unsatisfied when it comes to the romance in both of these films because let me let me tell you something okay when it comes to i feel pretty specifically i had questions i had questions as to why the person i wanted Renee to end up with didn't end up with her <laughs> what hmm. let's talk about Tom Hopper <laughs> Let's take a brief detour into Liam Hemsworth versus Tom Hopper, okay? Tom wins hands down, I can tell you up front already, okay? And let me explain to you why. Because even though they're both, you know, physically attractive or conventionally physically attractive, I mean, I don't need to tell you that, okay? You have eyes. However, Tom's character, Grant Leclerc, okay, was so much more charming. He was so much more likable. Firstly, due to the story device in I Feel Pretty being an internal change within Renee as opposed to an external change that we see in the world of isn't it romantic the grant that we are introduced to is his authentic self like he is the real grant unlike the uh, Liam Hemsworth character I believe his name is Blake that we're introduced to in isn't it romantic which means then that the attraction that grant feels towards Renee due to her exuding that confidence that self-belief is real <laughs> like it's authentic and even though Renee's sense of self-confidence may not feel authentic to her because she believes that that kooky thing happened to her as we've already established she doesn't actually go through any external changes to her so he actually likes her for who she is when she feels confident in herself and there's nothing wrong with that like there's literally nothing wrong with that the moral of the story there is that he's attracted to her self-confidence I, I literally don't see an issue I literally don't see a problem so why didn't she end up with him <laughs> why didn't she end up with him I listen I was rooting for her to end up with him not because you know Ethan is a bad guy or whatever he's fine like he's fine but for once I would have liked to see this plus size woman and Amy Schumer's not like plus size whatever but <laughs> I would have liked to see her end up with the hot guy like the conventionally attractive guy because that would have been a sort of subversion of the tropes that we see in rom-coms where you know these conventionally attractive people always end up together I would have liked to see something different happen in I Feel Pretty especially because it does such a good job of subverting a ton of other tropes that this one little thing you couldn't give to me <laughs> you couldn't give me just the small thing I know I was talking about realism earlier but throw that out of the window for now and let's talk about subverting these rom-com tropes and getting Renee and uh, Grant together because that, that's what I was rooting for that's what I wanted to see at the end of the film and that's why unfortunately I was disappointed when she ended up with Ethan she didn't even end up kissing Grant because she uh, she was stopped like just uh, it was unfortunate <laughs> but on the flip side of this you have isn't it romantic and like I said because the changes in that world are external meaning all of the characters on the outside are actually affected by this magical juju situation that happens it means that Blake liking Natalie plays into the hot guys can't really fall for plus size women who aren't conventionally attractive trope and this is played up for last throughout the film and there are some funny moments where this is explored in a very comedic way but I do think that ultimately it makes a mockery of the character of Natalie because she is this plus size woman who doesn't fit into this very narrow-minded view <laughs> the small box of what is conventionally attractive so it's obscene it's absurd that someone like Liam Hensworth's Blake would find her attractive so like I said overall I would say that Adam Levine's Josh would win in the love interests department okay 
But if we're going to sneak in a small little sidebar that is like perhaps love interest contenders, Tom Hopper wins. Tom Hopper wins. Absolutely. Grant is a great character that I wish we'd seen more of. And I wish he had been the main love interest to really subvert the tropes of rom-coms and this belief that this conventionally attractive guy would never end up with a woman like... Renee, who's like still attractive, whatever, <laughs> we need to move on. <laughs> so next up, let's talk about the supporting cast because we all know supporting casts are pretty important when it comes to rom-coms. They largely go ignored. <laughs> They're largely just decoration for the background, but they do play an important role of just setting up the world that the leads exist in. So it really can make a difference when you have a really great supporting cast in a rom-com, even if they aren't the major features of that film. But here I have to say, Without a doubt, I very much prefer the supporting cast in I Fall Pretty. I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but they're superior in every way. Listen, <laughs> first of all, we have big names in this film. We have Naomi Campbell in this film. <laughs> Michelle Williams is in this film. White Michelle, obviously. White Michelle Williams is in this film. She is playing the character of Avery Leclerc, who is the heir to the Leclerc fortune and the Leclerc company that she's inherited from her grandmother. And she is trying to spearhead this new campaign where they sell products towards, you know, people who aren't able to afford their luxury makeup products. And that's where Renee comes in and gives her an alternative perspective on how to handle this campaign because she can relate to the people that they're selling these products to in a way that Avery could not even begin to <laughs> begin to relate as the heir to no doubt a multi-million perhaps even billion dollar company but when it comes to Michelle Williams's portrayal of this character there is one key defining characteristic that is is pretty unmissable okay you'll know it when you see oh <laughs> should I say here yeah, it it is of course her squeaky voice <laughs> now her squeaky voice is interesting <laughs> her squeaky voice is a choice okay it's very much part of her i guess somewhat of a character arc because it's basically supposed to represent a sort of insecurity that she has about herself we're all about giving people insecurities in this film okay <laughs> other than the character of grant i mean i guess he has an insecurity but it's not like a proper one anyway because <laughs> he's perfect anyway i've already talked about him but when it comes to avery you know she feels insecure because of her voice even though as she says she's spoken to vocal coaches and she's uh, well, that's literally the only thing that she's done but she worked really hard to overcome her voice but she just has to accept it and by the end of the film that's exactly what she does she embraces her voice and embraces the fact that she does have something to offer to her grandmother's company despite always second guessing herself but as serious as all of that sounds <laughs> again because her voice is squeaky it is more of a comedic choice which again this is a rom-com we do want some sprinklings of comedy here or there and I do think it does add a bit more of a unique factor when it comes to the character of Avery because that's something that I can remember her by whereas when it comes to the side characters and isn't it romantic I for example and isn't it romantic Betty Gilpin's character who is Natalie's best friend in the real world transforms into this bitchy female boss caricature when the world is changed into a rom-com and as fun as it was to see the film explore that trope that we often see in rom-coms where you know female bosses can never get along with their female employees they're always portrayed as bitches who are just so unreasonable and just so stubborn and mean and cruel it's fun to see the film explore that but other than the fact that it was a trope that we see oftentimes in rom-coms and that was explored and satirized in isn't it romantic as were many other tropes there weren't really any unique standout characteristics when it comes to the portrayal of this character overall and she's supposed to be the kind of equivalent to uh, michelle williams as avery and just out of the two i would say one certainly stands out more than the other but speaking of caricatures let's talk about isn't it romantic and its portrayal of the gay best friend now i am very aware <laughs> i am very aware that yet another the trope that this film tries to subvert is the idea of the gay best friend like this is a caricature that we've seen in uh, films time and time again and honestly it's old it's antiquated we need to abolish it we need to abolish it immediately the two-dimensional underdeveloped undercooked gay best friend caricature no <laughs> no not anymore i do like the fact that isn't it romantic kind of baits that out it says you know here you go this is how ridiculous this caricature looks i appreciated that however <laughs> however However, and it's not really up for me to decide this because I'm not part of the community, but I do have to wonder to what extent 
it also added to the problem because here's the thing <laughs> when it comes to the portrayal of this gay best friend character who's portrayed by brandon scott jones it seems to me that for the majority of the film yes it does try to subvert the trope of the gay best friend by kind of highlighting how ridiculous and exaggerative it is but he does also serve the purpose of a gay best friend that we would see in other rom-coms. Is this level of lampshading enough or do we actually need to see this character have another purpose, have a life of his own that is completely devoid of Natalie's, you know, worries and troubles? And somewhat to the film's credit, they do try to address this at the very end where he turns out to be a completely different type of character when the world <laughs> reverts back to what it was before um, and he's just essentially this like drug dealer from the, the block of flats that they live in and he's just low-key he's like the complete opposite to the stereotypical gay best friends um, archetype but my point still stands that for the majority of the film he is still that stereotype and he does still fulfill the same purpose that other characters like him have in the past in other rom-coms oh, it does kind of sound like i'm just bullying isn't it romantic <laughs> like i'm just crapping all over this film but to be fair there are aspects of the film that i do very much enjoy so i wanted to highlight those here so so first of all when it comes to what isn't it romantic does quite well i will say that i do enjoy the satirization of rom-coms and the tropes that we find in them as I've been saying throughout this review and even though in some cases the jokes kind of perpetuate negative stereotypes specifically of plus size women I do think that scene where Natalie and Blake go on that date and then they have the whole date night and they're making out and Natalie's expecting to have sex with him after that but unfortunately because this rom-com is PG they never get to that stage and she's just so frustrated <laughs> the song kind of plays over it and it just kind of skips her head and she's like no <laughs> like I felt that I felt that for her so that was a hilarious scene I think that very much held up and also the film overall does feel a lot more carefree it does feel a lot more comedic and it does feel a lot more fun because whilst it does point out some of the negative stereotypes and the problematic aspects of rom-com it also finds a way to show its affection and love for rom-coms which is great and I do think that does fit in with Natalie's overall uh, character arc in the sense that you know she starts off hating rom-coms Thinking that they're ridiculous and exaggerative and unrealistic but in the end she embraces all of the aspects of this genre and finally this isn't really another category to pit these films against each other in but i did want to mention the costume designs of each of these films because i do think it's quite interesting to see that there are quite a bit of similarities in this front as well for example when it comes to the color palettes of both of these films we do have a prominence of yellow <laughs> as you can see from the posters of both films but we also have a lot of pinks and pastels and you know really bright pastel colors as well as we usually see in rom-coms i mean this is a kind of typical palette to work off of for this genre and i do think that the ensembles that both of these women wear in their respective posters are quite eye-catching and memorable and they fit them very well which is very important because we're dealing with tailoring for plus size women again Amy Schumer, <laughs> she isn't like overly plus size, but I guess because of Hollywood standards, she's plus size, whatever. But <laughs> when it comes to their tailoring, I think, you know, the costume designers did an excellent job of making these women look beautiful, okay, before, after, you know, throughout the entire film. And their clothes fit them very, very well, which is just so nice to see because, like I said, we don't often see plus size women leading these kinds of films. But with all of that being taken into consideration, overall, I have to say that the winning here has to be I Feel Pretty. This is shocking to some because apparently this film isn't quite as loved by many as it is by me but I very much enjoy this film. I think its messaging is right on point. I think the character arc that Renee goes through is very very relatable and it's a nice twist on the common trope that we see in rom-coms and comedies overall. Someone bumping their head and their whole life changing because of inexplicable circumstances because this time around it's just in her head. There's nothing that has physically changed and it's just about her mindset and the way that she goes out there puts herself out there in the world and how the world receives her consequently i love that message i think it's so effective and i think it can apply to anyone in the real world because we won't realistically go through a situation where the world becomes a rom-com or whatever but we could go through a situation where if we shift our mindset we shift our understanding of what we can offer to society to our jobs to our relationships 
relationships, we too can see a change in the lives that we live and our approaches to the lives that we live. But that's it from me. Now that I told you guys my thoughts on I Feel Pretty versus Isn't It Romantic, it's time for you guys to let me know what you thought of these films down in the comments below and let me know who you think should win. Do you agree with me or do you think I'm crazy? <laughs> and also whilst you're already in the comments, don't forget to drop down some recommendations for future versus videos that might appear on my channel. But please be sure to subscribe to my channel to catch new uploads. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it and I will see you in the next one. Bye!